First thing you need to know is LDL cholesterol is very highly conserved, evolutionarily speaking. All mammals have LDL. There are some studies in humans that show like people in the ICU just inherently have much lower levels of LDL. Now we haven't teased out yet, did their illness make their LDL go low or did they develop their illness because their LDL was low? Vioxx is probably bad for people's heart and, and, and it is. And also all the anti-inflammatories have that same potential side effect. So anybody taking Celebrex or any, or any anti-inflammatory daily, you're part of an experiment right now. How long can a human take an, an anti-inflammatory every single day of their life until that becomes a problem? So why in the hell would you ever look for a benefit of having L, high LDL? But we do know from the data that we're able to grab and reparse that people with the lowest LDL cholesterols, they die younger, they have higher rates of cancer, and they have a higher rate of infectious death, and they have a higher rate of autoimmune conditions. Fix your metabolic health by eating a very, very low carbohydrate, unprocessed, one ingredient, keto, ketovore, carnivore diet. Fix your metabolic health, and then everything else will take care of itself. Oh, we just learned in the 1970s that fatty red meat is very unhealthy for you. Really? Because, you know, for the last three and a half million years, our, our ancestors ate as much fatty red meat as they could get their hands on. They would only eat that if they had access to that every day. Mm -hmm. So, but now we discovered in the 1970s, it's now, it's bad for us, really? I feel like it's all set up to keep people sick and keep them feeding on the medications, to keep them getting the surgeries, not to kill people, but to keep them sick and dependent on this sick care system. Uh, big food and big pharma don't make much money at all off somebody who's eating a proper human diet and living a proper human life. They don't make any money off dead people except that one-time fee. But in the middle where people are metabolically ill, that's the people buying the highly processed food, and that's also the people buying all the pharmaceuticals. Kind of, that would be our profit niche right there. We wouldn't be interested at all in metabolically healthy people who ate, you know, eat meat and eggs and a little bit of veg. We wouldn't care about them. We wouldn't waste a single ad dollar on them because, what, 87% of the U.S. adult population, they're right where we want them. Okay, we are ready to rock because I see Dr. Kim Berry join the studio. Um, we got the... PhD himself, proper human diet himself. So I'm going to introduce him properly and we're going to have some fun. This is a photo of me and Dr. Barry last uh, August in Orlando. I have been uh, so blessed to be able to not only watch him speak several times in person, but honored to share the stage with him on multiple occasions. All of you know who he is. Uh, he's a medical doctor. He's in Tennessee. He's got a great accent. He's got a beautiful family. He has this book that you saw me reading at the beginning of the session. Um, go get the book. Lies, my doctor told me. He's writing a brand new book. This is also available on Audible. He is a no BS kind of guy. And uh, you're going to love this conversation. Without further ado, here he is, Dr. Ken Berry. What is up, brother? Hey, my friend. How's it going? Man, it was going really good. Now that I see you, it's going outstanding. Same. How is everything in Tennessee? Everything's great here. We need a little rain. Um, doing my social media thing, working on writing some books, uh, taking care of the farm, the sheep, the chickens, the turkey, the quail, all that kind of stuff. And two babies and then trying to keep my beautiful wife happy. So I've got several full-time jobs. <laughs> yes, you do. I appreciate you being here today with us even more. It's a Saturday and you got all that going on. Uh, we had plenty of rain here last week. We'll just send it up your way uh, next heard week. That. We, we heard got that. You. Yeah. Let's uh, start the conversation here, Dr. Barry. Lipids. Uh, I know you get this all the time on your YouTube and social media. Uh, Dr. Barry, I started doing keto. I started doing carnivore and my cholesterol went from 210 to 280. My LDL went up and my doctor wants me to go on a statin. Now, this is not medical advice. We're not telling anybody to go on a statin or get off of statin, but I would love for this group here to understand what that means when we eat more fat. Will that tend to happen, and is that a bad thing? So what we're seeing from the millions of anecdotal cases now of people who've adopted a, a keto diet, a ketovore diet, or a carnivore diet that's higher in fat is that about one-third of people, their LDL cholesterol will actually go down a little bit about one third of the people, it'll stay the same. 
and about one third of people, it goes up. And out of that one third of people, about 5% of people, their LDL skyrockets to levels that maybe their primary care doctor has never seen in their life. That's, that's what we're seeing in the, in the low carb community globally. Uh, and we don't, we have not been able to do the research yet to tease out who is it that their LDL goes down? Who is it? It stays the same. Who is it? It goes up. Uh, Dave Feldman at all are in the, they have research ongoing at this moment about that three to 5% group of people that we've labeled lean mass hyper responders. These people are, are usually very, very lean uh, they tend to have very low triglycerides, very high HDL, and then they'll have spooky high total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. LDL. Are you one of them? What's that? Are you one of them? I, well, I don't know. I, I wouldn't consider myself lean enough to fit the category, but Dave Feldman and I have talked about this multiple times, and I think they're kind of revamping the definition mm. uh, so that I think ultimately if – your triglycerides don't have to be super low and you don't have to be super lean, but if you are at a healthy body fat percentage, I think eventually there'll either be a, a widening of the lean mass hyperresponder category, or there'll be a secondary category that is defined where people with, with who have still low triglycerides and, and relatively high HDL, but whose body fat percentage, maybe will go by waist to height ratio, mm -hmm. right? And so that if you fit fit in this category of waist to height ratio, which I my waist to height ratio is good, it's 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 right at 0. 0.5, even though I still I weigh 230 pounds and I'm still definitely carrying more fat than I would like to in my midsection. I think the vast majority of that is is subcutaneous fat. Uh, I've got a, a new DEXA scan coming up. I've got scheduled, and we'll see what the actual number of my visceral adiposity is. Uh, but I think that there's there's probably going to be a broadening of the lean mass hyperresponder category as time goes on. So lipids, first thing you need to know is LDL cholesterol is, is very highly conserved, evolutionarily speaking. And so all mammals have LDL. Some have LDL levels that are higher than humans, some don't, but it's very broadly conserved. And anytime you see that in evolutionary biology, that's very important. Other things that are very highly conserved would be things like melatonin, even mm -hmm. insects who, who are, haven't been our close relatives for hundreds of millions of years. Still, they make melatonin. And then what that tells you is as a biologist is that's super, super, that's probably mandatory for life at any higher level. You've got to have some kind of sleep-wake cycle and melatonin and all the other things melatonin does as well. LDL is like that. It's very, very widely conserved across different uh, clades. So that's number one. Number two, we know that LDL cholesterol is used by the immune system. People with very, very low levels of LDL cholesterol, which is not fat. It's actually a protein, right? The LDL is a protein molecule. That it, people who have very low levels of that, and definitely we've seen this in many rodent studies, mice and rats, if their LDL is too low, they're going to die of a bacterial infection or cancer. That's just what's going to happen. And, and there, there are some studies in humans that show like people in the ICU just inherently have much lower levels of LDL. Now, we haven't teased out yet. Did their illness make their LDL go low or did they develop their illness because their LDL was low? And there's a huge experiment going on on this about this right now that many of your listeners may actually inadvertently be a lab rat in that experiment. Oh, yeah. So the way that pharmaceuticals get FDA approval is they do first animal studies to show it's not acutely toxic. And then they'll do limited human studies again to show this drug is not acutely toxic. It doesn't, it's not going to kill you quickly. And when they are able to prove that the FDA gives them, and, and then also show that their drug is a little better than placebo, right? Better statistically better than placebo. You get your FDA approval and then that drug is put on the market. Now, so for example, drugs like Repatha, which is the injectable uh, that lowers your LDL levels down to levels like 
20 or 30 or 40. That's FDA approved now. Uh, Repatha and Proluent, those are the two drugs in the United States that are like that. They're not statins. They're PCSK9 inhibitors. And they lower your LDL cholesterol drastically. Now, there, I guarantee you several of your people are on Repatha or Proluent. And there's a third one that, that's in stage three trials right now that will be on the market before long because they'll, again, be able to pu- uh, prove that it's not acutely toxic to the mm-hmm. human organism. This key word right there is acute. That's right. Now, some your few number, hopefully it's not many, I hope, but they may be saying, well, I'm sure that there's been you know studies showing it's long-term safe in humans. And the answer to that would be no, no, there's not a single study showing long-term safety, showing that it's not a slow poison, showing that's that's not a cumulative toxin over years. There is no study on the planet that shows that. That study is going on right now. It's called post-marketing research. And so every time one of you guys who's on Repatha or Braduin and you have a huge staphylococcal infection, you wind up in the ER, then hopefully your doctor will report that to the database, right? Now, how how often do you think that actually gets reported to the database? Not very often. Only a few docs who are into research and into that kind of stuff will even know that they should report that. Oh, this person on Repatha had a huge staphylococcal infection, was in the ICU for three weeks, almost died, was on the vent for a week, was on the respirator for four days, that's probably not going to get reported to the database, but that's actually that's actually the research that's going on right now. And they know that, obviously. That's that's why they're not concerned yeah, about it. Not so, to yeah, yeah Pfizer and Merck and all the billion dollar pharmacy corporations, they know that the actual reporting is very anemic. The doctors are busy. They don't, many doctors don't know to report that. I back when I had ICU patients at the medical center, if if I had had somebody come in with just fulminant staphylococcal infection, septic, all on death's door. It would not have occurred to me, oh, let me check their medicine list and see if they're on anything that could have weakened their immune system, unless it was a steroid, right? Or something obvious. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have made that connection back in 2005. And so the average doctor today is still not making that connection. And so the data they do glean, only if it's a very large signal, will it show up in the reporting. So if it's, if it's still abs- an absolute slow poison with regards to your immune system, it might take a decade hmm. for that signal to be strong enough in the reported uh, adverse events for them to go, Oh, this may be a thing. Right. And so I want to take a quick break from the video you're watching to share something with you that has made a big difference with my health and the thousands and thousands of students that I teach all across the world. Now, this is a unique device that has been shown to help with skin health, sore muscles, wrinkles, psoriasis, eczema, scoliosis, migraines, sleep issues, arthritis, acne, scar tissue, wound healing, relaxation, and also boost testosterone levels. What am I talking about? What is this miracle drug? Well, it's not a miracle drug. It's red light therapy. As you can see here, this is called photobiomodulation. And I use this red light therapy device every single day. Not only do I use it, my fiance uses it. Our dogs and cats love it. And the device I have here is from Bond Charge. Bond Charge has a different range of big panels, small panels, from affordable to ones that are a little bit more money, depending on how much you want. And I love this product. I feel so good. And it doesn't take a lot of time to get all these benefits. I simply take off my glasses, which is Bond Charge glasses, by the way, turn it on. And I have it running for 20 minutes once a day. And turn it on. And as you can see, I just leave it there on my desk as I work. 10, 20 minutes uh, per day will suffice. And it makes a big difference. You're going to notice a big improvement with your skin health and all the things we mentioned earlier in just a matter of weeks. So if you want to get your hands on this Bond Charge red light device or get their big panels, they also have panels that you could take on the go that are more affordable then head over to bondcharge.com slash ketocamp and use the coupon code ketocamp to get 15% off your red light device or as a matter of fact, your entire order. Any product, you could get 15% off with that nice coupon code ketocamp. So whether it's these Bond Charge blue light blocking glasses, their sauna blanket, 
or any of their awesome products, use that coupon code KETOCAMP at checkout. We'll drop a link down below. Go check them out. They are awesome. And let's get back to today's video. Uh, all you guys, the same goes for statins. I mean, we've been prescribing statins now for decades. So that's been going on long enough that if a statin wasn't a acute enough toxin, there would have been enough of the signal in the data by this point to go, oh, oh, that's really bad. We need to look at that, right? And so this is exactly what happened with drugs like Vioxx. They showed it wasn't acutely toxic in people. They got FDA approval. They marketed the hell out of it. Millions of people were taking it. And then people started dying of heart attacks. And, and, and so it still, the, the sales and the ads went on for years after that started happening and was reported only when enough cases had accumulated. And so again, just imagine how many doctors made that connection to actually report that. Very few, maybe 5%, 10%, maybe. And so even with that low reporting percentage rate, you still eventually after years, we saw the signal enough to go, oh shit, Vioxx is probably bad for people's heart. And, and, and it is. And also all the anti-inflammatories have that same potential side effect. So anybody taking Celebrex or any, or any anti-inflammatory daily, you're part of an experiment right now. How long can a human take an, an anti-inflammatory every single day of their life mm -hmm. until that becomes a problem, right? So LDL has many, many functions in the human body, many of which haven't even been discovered yet, guarantee you, because right. nobody's looking because LDL is a villain. It's a demon. Mm -hmm in the average researcher's mind. So why in the hell would you ever look for a benefit of having L high LDL? But we do know from the data that we're able to grab and reparse from studies that were done in the past that people with the lowest LDL cholesterols, they die younger, they have higher rates of cancer, and they have a higher rate of infectious death, and they have a higher rate of autoimmune conditions. So that, that signal is clear, but it's not compelling enough to make people at the higher echelons of the medical hierarchy to go, oh shit, yeah. Uh, but hopefully with the work that Dave Feldman and Paul Mason and, and David Diamond are doing, hopefully when enough of this data is reparsed, kind of looked at with fresh eyes, with, the, with a different paradigm, they're going to be able to publish enough of this data to go, you guys, you know, if you need to look at this again. This is a big, probably a big deal at at least a population level. And so, so many things about LDL cholesterol. I just had David Diamond on my channel and we did an hour and 20 minutes and he had tons of his slides. And I think anybody, any, first of all, any healthcare provider, if they watch that video, that's going to make them think twice about, oh, LDL is a demon. Yeah, it, we, it needs to be stamped out. And there are actually cardiologists on Twitter who will say, I wish that I could make your LDL zero. Mm. And it's like, dude, just the very fact that you said that out loud on Twitter tells me that you have a severe lack of understanding of the basic physiology of what LDL cholesterol does in the human body. It's very concerning, but they're happy to jump on the, the bandwagon. Because, you know, how it's I mean, how bad is it as a cardiologist practicing in a bigger center if you're good friends with Pfizer and Merck? Mm -hmm. That's probably it's probably not bad. Probably mm -hmm. gets you lots of little off the off the books perks. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think just watching that video or listening to it as a podcast, because I've got it on my YouTube channel as a podcast as well. So you can just listen to it. Uh, I think many people who are still taking a, at least a high dose statin or taking Repatha or Praluent will go, Eesh. and also we listed the studies. They're all listed in the show notes, so you can actually print those studies out, take them with you to your next doctor's appointment, and then hopefully open a meaningful dialogue where your doctor, you know, like you like to read research, right, doctor? I mean, you're interested in research. What doctor's going to say no? <laughs> and then you're going to say, great, because I read this study that really concerns me because I'm taking high dose Zocor, Lipitor, Crestor, and I, I found out that the one that I'm taking actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. That would be Lipitor and Zocor are the two most popular yeah. ones across yeah. the blood-brain barrier, unchanged. So what's that doing to my risk of Alzheimer's, doctor? I mean, I don't know. This study, e, would you please read this, and then we could have a conversation about that. 
that that's kind of, that is that sort of behavior by patients is moving the needle much more than I ever anticipated it would. I, I initially started recommending people do that just to mess with their doctor, just to, <laughs> right, to get a rise out of them. But then people started reporting back. My doctor read the paper and now he's like, he's fine with me taking just a tiny dose of Crestor. He said, that's, that's fine. Well, let's just do that. At least you're getting some benefit without the risk of these side effects that we're seeing in this, in this research that I, as a doctor was not aware of. That's the kind of the classic reply. I wasn't aware of that. And that's because when the, when the, the, the Zocor, Lipitor, Crestor drug rep comes, they don't tell doctors that they just tell, they give, they've got a glossy handout of all the benefits and then also some bagels with lots of, 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 of cream cheese, right? Cause they know what doctors like. And that's what the doctor knows about it because they don't have time to research every single topic. But when a patient takes the effort to bring in some research studies and go, there's this new study that shows that if my metabolic health is normal, like my A1C, my fasting insulin, my triglycerides, my HDL, if they're all normal, then there's really actually no benefit at all to me taking a statin. Have you read that paper? No doctors read that, right? Mm -hmm. All of us in the low carb community have read it and memorized it. But the average doctor out there has no idea that study even exists. They don't know to look for it. And so that's why I encourage every single one of your people who are taking a statin or a path or pralguent to watch that video and print out the research studies and take to their doctor and go, doc, I'm a little concerned about this. Are, were you aware of this? Because mm -hmm. doctors don't like to not be aware of stuff. They kind of <laughs> yeah. like to be in the know. And so at some point that, that, that may wind up on the doctor's desk for a month or two, but at some point they're going to be like, oh yeah, right, let me look at this. And that, that could be the beginning of changing how that doctor practices medicine for the rest of their career. Yeah. That's the true power. You know, if the doctor just says, okay, fine, Judy, we'll decrease your Crestor from, from, from 20 milligrams down to five milligrams. That's great. But what if that doctor says, maybe I should do that with all my patients on a stack? Mm -hmm. Just change the trajectory, uh, trajectory of medical practice in that entire community. Yeah. That's, uh, that's powerful. Right. And so there, there's so much about LDL cholesterol. We still don't know because no, it, just imagine if you're a young researcher and you went to your department head and said, Hey doc, I think that, that high dose statins, I think that there's maybe more bad effects than good effects. I need $500,000. I want to do a study. And the, the chairman who's also good buddies with the local Pfizer guy is like, wait, you want to do a study trying to prove that high dose statins are, unhealthy what are you talking no about? way yeah no way yeah get out of here go think of something else that's dumb that's not going to get off the ground and so only with crowdfunded research like dave Feldman, david diamond paul mason are doing will we ever grab the data that we need to definitively show in the in the peer-reviewed literature oh yeah a high dose statin for a long enough period of time is going to increase your risk of the following things you maybe should Fix your metabolic health by eating a very, very low carbohydrate, unprocessed, one ingredient, keto, ketovore, carnivore diet. Fix your metabolic health and then everything else will take care of itself. That's right. And Alina, drop that link for Dr. David Diamond and Dr. Ken Berry's interview so we could put it for everybody watching here. So let me get this straight. There's no long-term studies done on these LDL reducing meds. Yet the backlash that the big pharma, big food companies say about keto and carnivore is that there's no long-term studies. Is that That's correct? Right. That's exactly correct. Yes. You got yeah. it. Seems hypocritical to me. Yeah. Also, there's no long-term data proving that the American Diabetes Association diet is healthy for diabetics to eat long-term. There's no long-term data supporting the American Heart Association's DASH diet, mm -hmm. that it's safe for long-term human consumption. Uh, so, you know, people love to throw that, uh, that being critical about keto. Oh, there's no long-term data showing it's safe. Well, okay. What about your diet? Is there any long-term data showing that it's safe for daily consumption for, for years or decades? The answer is invariably no, there is none. And so that's why when I talk about an ancestrally appropriate diet, that feels to people who want it, want all things modern. That feels like saying, well, we should just do things the old fashioned way, or we should just do what we've always done. But when it comes to biology, that's one of the few instances where that's exactly what you should do. 
you should figure out, first of all, what kind of a diet did our ancestors eat for millions of years? And you should eat that diet until it's proven unsafe with long-term studies, because obviously it's not too unsafe or we'd be extinct. Right? It's not too unsafe or we wouldn't be the apex species on this planet now. That's right. It's obviously not too unsafe or we would just be some little hick species in some backwater somewhere and there'd be some other species that ran the planet. It must be a pretty damn good diet. And that same kind of thinking you could apply to, to fatty red meat. Mm -hmm. Oh, we just learned in the 1970s that fatty red meat is very unhealthy for you. Really? Because, you know, for the last three and a half million years, our, our ancestors ate as much fatty red meat as they could get their hands on. Every single day they could get it. That's, they, would, that would, they would only eat that if they had access to that every day. Mm -hmm. so, but now we discovered in the 1970s it's, now, it's bad for us? Really? Come on. What are you talking about? And part of the problem is, is doctors get very little nutrition training, which most of your people know. But what you may not have ever thought of is they get zero training in anthropology, mm. paleoanthropology, none, zero, none. Like if you even suggested to a uh, the director of a medical school, hey, you should start having an anthropology class. So, so, so the doctors can kind of get a grasp that what we've done in the past, that's probably pretty important. What we've what we've eaten in the past, how we lived in the past. Right. Uh, but you, there's none of that. And the, the medical school director would laugh at you like, dude, we've only got so many days in the calendar year. We can't have an anthropology class. How, how would that be relevant? How would they learn about all the new pharmaceuticals if they were spending time in an anthropology class? So true. You know, for years, I used to always, regarding this topic of conventional medicine versus alternative, holistic, whatever you want to call it. I used to have, I used to be an optimist saying, you know, they're just confused. You know, they, they haven't caught up with the research, but now, and I'm far from a cynic and I'm still an, op like a, <laughs> I look at the bright side of things, but now, and I want to hear if you're aligned with this, I feel like it's all set up to keep people sick and keep them feeding on the medications to keep them getting the surgeries, not to kill people, but to keep them sick and dependent on this sick care system. I think it's all just strategically set up and set up. And I hate to be cynical, but what do you think? I know that you talk a lot about this, but I'd love for you to share it. Yeah. So let's just say that you and I, Ben, were nefarious little minions. And we wanted to, to develop a system where we could make billions of dollars and not kill anybody acutely. Right. Not we're not we're not that evil. But if what we were doing kind of harmed their health gradually and slowly over decades and decades, but we could make money selling them the food. Right. And we can make money selling them the pharmaceuticals to then treat that chronic disease that would pop up in five to 50 years and just make billions every year. And so it's a brilliant business model. Well, how, how would you design such a business model? How would you design that? It mean, you're going to sit down and, and pencil it out. It would probably look a whole lot like what we got right now. And so in that respect, I hear you. I totally get that it feels like, and, and many people go down the full conspiracy route, like this was, was all designed because uh, big food and big pharma don't make much money at all off somebody who's eating a proper human diet and living a proper human life, right? They don't make any money off dead people except that one-time fee. Hmm. But in the middle where people are metabolically ill, that's the people buying the highly processed food. And that's also the people buying all the pharmaceuticals. That's people getting all the medical testing. So kind of that would be our profit niche right there. We wouldn't be interested at all in metabolically healthy people who ate, you know, eat meat and eggs and a little bit of veg. We wouldn't care about them. We wouldn't waste a single ad dollar on them because what, 87% of the U.S. adult population, they're right where we want them. Mm hmm so I honestly don't think this is a conspiracy. I, I don't think it was designed this way. I think that due to multiple decisions by thousands of people over the decades have led us to this place. It's, it's kind of like the health insurance bottleneck we're in right now in the United States. So people don't realize where health insurance came from. Back in, in the Nixon administration, 
they actually put a wage freeze because of the economy. They said, you can't give your people raises anymore. So the big companies like General Motors, DuPont, that had thousands of employees, they're like, how are we going to attract the best people? Well, we can offer them fringe benefits. And so that's before that, you just paid a few dollars a month. You got your own health insurance if you thought you might need it. You paid for that yourself. And the, the rates were very cheap. And some doctors took it, some didn't. But when when IBM and DuPont and all these huge corporations started offering as a fringe benefit, then all of a sudden doctors were like, wait a minute, that's 50,000 people that work for IBM. I probably should take that. Right. And then the insurance companies came in and they saw a, a, an opportunity. Oh, we can make millions right here. We'll just offer this product and we'll raise the deductible a smidge and we'll lower the coverage a smidge. Not much, just a little. And that's going to be our profit. Hey, Keto Camper, I want to interrupt the video real quick to share with you what I believe is one of the most important nutrients that we should be taking every single day. Most people are deficient in this nutrient, and it's responsible for over 400 enzymatic activities in your body. And your body just doesn't make it, so it's required to be taken in a high-quality supplement or from high-quality foods. The problem with the food is that our soil is depleted, and it's hard to get this quality nutrient. So what is this nutrient? It's called magnesium. But I'm going to share something with you very fascinating. Check this out. Upgraded Formulas has this incredible product called Upgraded Magnesium. And Barton Scott, the developer of this product and company, he's a brilliant guy. He created nanoparticle magnesium, which has the ability to penetrate your membranes and go right into your cells. There's a 99.99 percentage absorption rate. Now, this is unheard of because with other magnesium products, you better believe it's not that high. And there's an interesting study they're doing with Upgraded Mag I want to share with you real quick. Early results from a sleep study with Dr. Sachin Patel showed that the average doctor in the group using this product has achieved an improvement of over 35% in deep sleep. More sleep studies and a double-blind controlled placebo study with Upgraded Magnesium is coming sooner. And you better believe those results are going to be super exciting. We already know this. Upgraded Magnesium is easily the best supplement you can take for better sleep, including deep sleep, muscle aches, cramping, and any other signs of a magnesium deficiency, which is so common, unfortunately. What makes Upgraded Formulas unique, as I mentioned, is that it's a nanoparticle. This means it is absorbed very rapidly and efficiently by your blood cells. They produce a plasma-like version of minerals that the body recognizes and absorbs without digestion. And the results are phenomenal. I really believe just taking this for a couple of nights, you'll notice a big difference. So if you want to get Upgraded Formulas, Upgraded Mag, and any of their products. They also do some incredible hair mineral analysis tests to see your mineral imbalances and deficiencies, et cetera, and other incredible products that we've referenced before. Head over to upgradedformulas.com and use the coupon code KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Coupon code is KETOSIS to get 15% off your entire order. I'm going to drop a link for you down below in the notes of this video. Okay, let's go back to this video. And now let's just hit the fast forward button and come from, from the 70s up to where we're at now. Now we've got this billion dollar health insurance conglomeration. We've got the, the, the federal government now saying maybe we need universal health care for all. Uh, we've got all the employers saying I can no longer afford to give my employees health insurance. We've, you've got people, just regular folks that are like, I'm sorry, my, my premium is how much mm -hmm. a month? Jesus, mm -hmm. right? And so now we've kind of reached the end of that. But that was not set up for some, you know, the insurance companies didn't go back and design that. It just kind of happened through government mm -hmm. regulation, corporate overreach, people trying to make a buck, which is human nature. And that's not inherently evil at all. That's a good thing. People trying to get ahead, trying to support their family. Mm -hmm. But when you've got all these people and you, then you've got the, the governmental disincentive, oh, you can't just give a guy a raise. So now DuPont and IBM are like, shit, how are we going to get the best? we got to do something else. Health insurance. Hey, you know, people that work for IBM, they got a family, they, they got a future. They, they want some insurance. Let's offer that. Boom. There you go. And so now we're, we come here and we're stuck in this 
just mess of health insurance that's so terrible that it makes you contemplate, oh, maybe we should have universal coverage that's just paid yeah. for the government. I want to I want to talk to you about that real quick. Um, first of all, can you imagine if they did that right now? The wage freezes in twenty twenty that would be insane. Right. But right. but let me just tell you, that's yeah, being discussed, right. guaranteed. Yeah, it's being discussed. You said I guarantee it's being discussed. I don't know any inside information, but anytime a government gets in a bind, they start looking at things that they would normally never consider. How, how do you understand how that? that Explain to me how that benefits the government. I, I don't I don't get that. Well, if wages keep going up, what's that going to do to inflation? Okay, so it's going to calm inflammation, inflation, excuse me. Exactly, which, okay. is, which is basically economic inflammation, right? It's, it's inflation. <laughs> yeah, sure. But yeah, it's some, so if inflation really become, get, starts to gallop and they're like, oh, crap, we got to get this under control, wage freezes would be one of the things in, in a government's toolkit that they would pull out to slow down the increasing rate of inflation. And so it, it, it's all human nature. It's all human nature. And so you can use that health insurance example, apply it to big food and big pharma. That's exactly what happened when the Makes 77 uh, McGovern Commission came out and said, we need to be eating low fat and we need to eat, be eating grains that then Kellogg's and Kraft and all the guys were like, okay, it turns out you can actually make a higher profit markup using vegetable seed oils and, and processed grains and sugar, you can make anything out of it and it's shelf stable for years. And you actually make a higher profit percentage markup. Huh? <laughs> so now all you have to do is apply human nature to that and then let the, let the clock run. And you wind up with a situation where we're at right now, where Kellogg's just announced the, or general mills just announced their new lucky charms, multicolor. <laughs> right with multicolor, like with a rainbow of marshmallows. Yeah, yeah. Right. You see what I'm saying? They're trying to cash in on several niches there, uh, but now you're, you, and, and then you've got tough school of nutrition mm -hmm. saying, Oh, lucky charms are much healthier for you to feed your child than an egg scrambled in butter. Mm -hmm. That's, that's literally true. That's literally a, in their food compass. Score. Yeah. Uh, Reese's puffs, cereal, little, little candy, is healthier for you to give your children each and every morning over and above much healthier than an egg scrambled in butter. Yeah. It's so it's, it's so ridiculous. Uh, yep. Yeah. On that list, it shows eggs cooked in canola oil was higher than eggs cooked in butter. It's just sure. so freaking sure. ridiculous. Sure. I, I do have a question about the health insurance thing, if we have time for that, but I want to get back to the LDL conversation. Sure. Uh, what are, what do you recommend in terms of testing? Do you recommend looking at the particle sizes of the LDL to kind of get an idea yeah. if it's problematic or not <clears throat> right now apob is very very popular among especially plant-based cardiologists and primary care providers uh there's a ton of problems with with apob even if you read the wikipedia entry it says things like uh we're still unclear on the mechanism uh we're still unclear of the the physiological pathway of this that or the other uh no, more research needs to be done about this that or the other but if you listen to the average plant-based cardiologist apob is that's it that's mm -hmm. the number that's what you want nothing else uh even over and above ldl cholesterol and so i think that the nmr lipo profile which gives you the particle numbers and the particle size i think that is probably a little better test because then you'll know which pattern of of uh, ldl particles you have and i think that's more useful, some degree, somewhat more useful, right? I don't think it's like, oh, a, a grand yeah, slam, no, but yeah. I think it's somewhat more useful. Uh, I, I think oxidized LDL is something that, that should probably be looked at for anybody with multiple risk markers for heart disease. Uh, I, I still just check a routine lipid panel and I look at the triglycerides and the HDL. That's all I care about currently because we've got robust evidence for decades now that having a, a low triglyceride and a high LDL or HDL is a very, very good proxy marker for overall metabolic health. Mm -hmm. And I would add to that a A1C and a fasting insulin or C peptide. And now with just those few tests, I, I think that you've got, all, if somebody's normal on all those tests, that person's metabolically healthy. And in that light, I don't care what their LDL cholesterol, I don't care if it's 150 or 450. I think mm -hmm. it is meaningless. 
Yeah, right on. And for those who missed session two, we went over those markers and the optimal ranges. So go back and watch that session. You still have access to that. Um, what about getting a calcium score? Let's say if somebody does all that and they're kind of, some of the markers are a little wonky. Do you recommend, okay, let's just see if there's any calcium built up. Should they yeah. go get a calcium score? Yeah. And I think so. Yes. And I think probably everybody over the age of 40 probably should get a CAC score at least one time in their life. Just so you've got that baseline number. Because what we know from the research of Dr. Arthur Agustin, who basically came up with the CAC scoring system, is that the average adult, their CAC score goes up about, on average, 20% a year. So if you had it checked and it was 100, then we would expect 12 months later for it to be 120. That's what we'd expect. That's normal. And so I, re I recommend to everybody in your, in your group, in your camp, get a CAC score done. Yeah. And then if it's if it's under a hundred, you're fine. Oh, you believe okay. under a hundred? Yeah. yeah. Now obviously pain. zero zero is pristine. Yes, definitely. And I, I had a long conversation with Dr. Agustin about this at uh, Low Carb Boca, and he said if you're if especially if you're 50, 60, 70, 80, mm -hmm. and your A1C is under a hundred. Your, 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 your calcium, your, you mean, not A1C. Calcium. I'm sorry. Yeah, your CAC score. If it's under a hundred and you're over the age of fifty you're fine. Mm. The odds of you having a heart attack are super, super low. Now, if you're 30 or 40 years old and your CAC scores 95, that's too high for your mm -hmm. age, right? But if you're 50 or over and your CAC scores under a hundred, you, you need to find something else to worry about besides a heart attack. Mm. But obviously if it's zero, then yeah, you're basically, you have 10 year insurance policy against having a heart attack essentially. And so I'd recommend everybody get, get a CAC just so you've got that baseline at whatever age you happen to be right now. Yeah. And then, you know, and then at any point in the future, you can do the math. What's 20% a year uh, that added to that. And then I'll repeat the CAC score in a year, two, three, four, five years. And if, if my progression is under that 20% threshold, I'm winning. Mm-hmm. But if yeah. it's above that, I need to look and go, wait a minute, why is it going up faster than I would expect it to and and fix that problem, which is almost always going to be dietary in nature. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about those dietary uh, things we can do before we get there. I want to ask you if you have a time cap, because I want to make sure we respect your time today. So how long do we have you? For yeah, we can get, we can go for a few more minutes. I'm coming up on one at the top of the hour in 12 minutes. Yep. So VIP students, uh, we have 12 minutes. Get into the StreamYard studio if you want to come and ask Dr. Barry your question. Uh, in about five minutes, we'll spend five minutes on VIP. Question uh, to close the, to land a plane on the calcium conversation. If a doctor, if somebody is working with their medical doctor and they're, they're pushing a statin because their markers are just a little off, would you recommend getting that calcium score? And if it shows zero, like that is like the proof, like why do I need a statin? Yeah. Yeah, definitely yeah. if you get a CAC and it's zero, even the American Heart Association agrees. It's in their guidelines now. If, it, if you have a CAC of zero, you're not going to benefit from a statin. Uh, I believe that you're not going to benefit from a statin regardless of what your CAC is. But even the AHA right. yeah. agrees that, yeah, if it's zero, your doctor can shut the hell up about the statin conversation. Okay, good. Uh, and so I think what you'll see as years go by is they're like, well, if it's if it's zero to nine, you can probably forego the stat. And then, it, oh, if it's zero to 20 or whatever the next number that like there's going to be a creep in that direction as more and more research is not only done, but also re looked at with fresh eyes by people like David Diamond and Dave Feldman. And they're like, actually, if you crunch the numbers, what this study actually shows is mm -hmm. then then they'll be like, well, OK, if it's if it's under twenty five. You don't need a statin. And that's going to happen. And so what they're doing there is they're allowing their big pharmaceutical buddies a few years, if not a decade, to retool and come up with new billion dollar drugs. See so how and now is that nefarious? Is that conspiratorial? Or is that just how business is done at the billion dollar level? Because they know they're going to get at least a hundred grand in donations from these big pharma guys every year especially if they've got cardiac drugs, statin drugs, mm -hmm. uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, they're going to get a, a, a check with at least six zeros from that guy every year to stay in the AHA's good graces. Of course, that's just good business. That's not, that's not conspiracy. That's, that's how business is done at that level. Yeah. That's how it's done, right? And so, but what that allows the pharmaceutical houses to do is go, oh shit, they can see, they can, they, they've got 
forecasters. That's all they do is sit around and look for trends. And they're like, yeah, the statin trend's going away. We need to start looking right now for something else. And, I, and most of them have already found it in the form of Ozempic and Wagovi and Monjuro. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's going to be their next billion dollar baby that yeah. they're going to ride to till the heavens fall. And they'll start to just step away from the statin thing. They'll cut, cut the advertising. They'll cut the visits to doctor's office. And the statin thing will just it literally what will happen is it'll just it'll shrivel up, whimper and it'll die a silent death. And there will never be a press conference going, you know, that whole statin thing. That was all bullshit. And we were wrong. That, that'll never happen. It'll yeah. just cease to be part of the conversation and just go away because, again, that's how you do business. You'd much prefer not to have a press conference and admit you're wrong if you can just kind of phase this out over the next three to 10 years. And then you're also moving your, your profits to other things and not depending on that for your profit. That's what I would do if I was the CEO. What would you do, Ben? Yeah, I mean, that's a smart business move, of course. You know, right. you don't want all that bad press. You don't want all that heat because then they're right. not going to trust you moving forward. So yeah, that's just the reality of it. Okay. We have eight minutes to go. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna skip the part about carnivore. I'll, I'll uh, stay on for the everybody on here, and I'll talk a little bit about carnivore when Kenbury hops off. But I want to get some questions here. By the way, you would have loved Dr. Fung was here with us a couple of days ago. Like he went on for 20 minutes about calorie count. It was just so much fun. You know his analogies, and he's just such a fun guy. And then Dr. Boz was here on Thursday, and she spoke about Ozempic and and the problem. Yeah. Actually, so. Yeah, and Fung's definitely onto something. The, you, that's another thing you're going to see talked about less and less and less is the calorie, 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 calorie out. Yeah. That's, that, that is a wounded animal. That ship has hit an iceberg, but it's not going to sink overnight. It's going to take probably a decade for, for the echoes of that lie echoing around social media and around, you know, between your mama and your hairdresser and your truck mechanic <laughs> right, yeah. until that finally just, it'll just stop being talked about. And yeah. people will be like, nah, calories in, calories out. I think that's bullshit, right? I heard that somewhere, but <laughs> that's going to take 10 years. And so for the next 10 years, they're going to be people who suffer under that paradigm with no success because they heard that from their favorite guru on Instagram or whatever. Yeah. When I, when I get comments from those gurus that talk about it, I, I reply, please catch up. <laughs> That's all I said. Yeah. Just please catch up. Dr. Fung essentially said like, they think they're so brilliant that they have this amazing idea that just eat less and move more. If that would have worked, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Like we wouldn't be arguing. Anyways, he's just so funny when he does it, but let's get to some questions here. So Sarah, I see your cameras on. I'm going to go to you first and then Cindy and Mickey. We have only seven minutes. So uh, if you could ask the question in 30 seconds or less, then I'll take you off the screen. And then Dr. Barry, if you could uh, answer succinctly sure. and then we could get to the next few. So here is Sarah Darter. Hey, Sarah. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, several years ago, I did about two years worth of raw food eating. Um, so what's your opinion about their idea that above 120 plus degrees, you're killing the nutrition in the food? Yep, good question. So uh, there's been actually quite a bit of research done on a raw food diet because it, it, back in the late 60s, early 70s, there was a very, very large movement, a raw food movement. And so it became super popular. And of course, there were some raw food vegans and there were just raw foodies, like everything needs to be raw. And it is absolutely true that when you cook above about 120 degrees, that you are going to denature some of the vitamins. And then perhaps some of the polyphenols and perhaps some of the other phyto and zoonutrients that are in the food. That's absolutely true. But it's typically a very small amount. And uh, I've talked to Bart Kay about this multiple times because he, he cooks his meat until it's literal wet leather. I mean, you know, like you could sharpen your knife on his steak when he's finished cooking it. But he's right. So the majority of the vitamins stay. Now, you don't lose any of the minerals or electrolytes because they are atoms. They're actually elements on the periodic table. Only if you cook your meat long enough to initiate nuclear fission or nuclear fusion will you change the, the minerals. The minerals are going to be there. But the vitamins, a certain percentage, you do lose those. But what you also do when you cook food is you unlock a bunch of nutrients that you wouldn't have had access to otherwise. And the reason the raw food movement failed was because everybody that adopted it, <clears throat> they lost weight. Oh, hell yeah, they lost weight. And until the point where they became so cachectic mm. that they literally couldn't function in society. And so you will see this on the, the raw vegan uh, YouTube channels. These people look like literal walking skeletons. You can, you could just, it's, it, it is impossible, even if you eat for 16 hours a day, to eat enough raw plants 
to give your body the nutrition that it needs to be vibrant and vigorous and virile and, and potent. You, you just can't, it is impossible. Now you can do it with meat, but you're still, you're going to, you're going to gain some vitamins, but you're going to lose others because cooking meat is something, cooking food is something that humans have been doing for at least 1 million years, at least probably longer, but we have research uh, in, in the archaeology that we know for 1 million years, our ancestors have been cooking over an open fire, right? Yeah. Or in some kind of container. So uh, we have evolved. That's lo- A million years is a long enough time for humans to evolve. Uh, our teeth have gotten smaller. Our, our uh, masseter muscles have gotten smaller. Our chewing muscles, our stomachs have gotten lazier. We still have very acidic stomach but we don't have the kind of stomach that can that can optimize with only raw food, especially raw plants. You're mm-hmm. just that that is a pipe dream if you think that's true. Yeah. And so I I'm I'm a I'm a medium rare guy for my steaks. I'm a I'm a medium for my ground beef if I know where the ground beef came from. Mm-hmm. I always have runny yolks. Like I'm I'm an undercooker, I guess you would say, based on the average amount of time people cook things because. I, I like to mimic our ancestors as much as possible. And I know that even though they had discovered cooking, there are many, many instances when they ate some beef tartare. And it may not have had chives and it may not have had, you know, some this, that, the other and a little quail egg on top. But there were many times and many situations where they just ripped out a hunk of liver or a hunk of, of fatty meat and they ate it raw. That's right. And so I, Nisha and I try at least once every two weeks, we, we make steak tartare out of just a ribeye that we've bought from Walmart or Kroger, like nothing special. And we always let most, most recipes say, Oh, don't, don't put the fat in there, but we hundred percent put the fat in our steak tartare. Mm-hmm. I, I like it better that way. But so there, is, there are some, a few drawbacks from cooking, but the vast amount of pluses or minuses with cooking food, as long as you don't overcook it are, are positives. Yeah, Sarah, that's a great question and a fantastic answer. We're, we ran out of time, but uh, I want to give Let's you do the one more. Let's oh, do, do one, one more. more. Okay. Yeah. Cindy, I'm going to bring you on here 30 seconds or less. And here we go. Hi, Cindy. Hey. Hi, Cindy. Hi. So I went to my endocrinologist for a checkup. Um, took me three months to get in. Um, and they did, uh, uh, you know, the TSH. For, I told them I wanted the whole TSH panel done. And um, they did. And uh, they uh, saw that my LDL was two points above what normal is, what yep. normal is. Yep. And he automatically wanted to put me on a statin. And I told him no. Yep. I said, I'm sure this can be um, fixed with food or, you know, uh, met- metabolically fixed. Yeah. And he kicked me out as a patient because of that. Yep. Some doctors believe with a religious fervousness, like literally it is, it's almost a religion level belief that high LDL is absolutely proven beyond any shadow of a rational doubt to increase your risk of having a heart attack or a stroke. They believe that in their heart of hearts. And that's why doctors like this get emotional, Ben. Right. When I was a doctor, if somebody came in and they had a raging uh, bacterial bladder infection and they were, I was like, oh, dude, you got a UTI. You need this antibiotic. They're like, no, I don't believe in antibiotics. I'm not going to take that. I would I'd be like, really? OK, well, here's here's what could happen. And if you don't take it, I wouldn't get emotional about that. I wouldn't be like, oh, I will fire you as a patient. I'll kick your ass out of here. I'll grab you physically and drag. I would have been like, well, that's dumb. But if that's what you want to do, that's fine. So anytime it's a great rule of thumb, anytime that a doctor becomes emotional Mm -hmm. because you don't want to do something or, or even more so if you want to discuss something or if you've brought a research paper and you're like, please read this. And I'll come back in a month. And then if if you're like, no, here's why this is wrong. Then I'll, I'll consider taking your statin or whatever other drug. But if a doctor becomes emotionally upset, that is a huge red flag. That means that they either just don't know what the hell they're doing, so they're going to follow the guidelines blindly, or it means that they've bought into this at a religiosity level, that, they, that that's, it's now part of their belief system. 
And what that means is that you're not going to change their mind with facts. Mm-hmm. It'd be like if I, if you're a Baptist and I came to your house and I'm like, look, you got to convert to, to be a Methodist. Being a Baptist is dumb. That would be an immediate emotional fight. They'd be like, no, F you. I'm, what are you talking about? No, you can't prove that. And I don't have to prove what I'm saying. So you get the hell out of my house. That would be immediately emotional, right? And that when a doctor goes immediately emotional, that's that's a huge red, red flag. You're not talking to a rational human about that topic. They're not being rational. And then she mentioned thyroids. And I wanted to let everybody know, uh, it, it, she said the full thyroid test, right, uh, lab panel. And if you're like, well, what is the full thyroid lab panel? So Kim Howerton and I wrote this book called Common Sense Labs that in it, we've got the full thyroid panel. We've got the full annual metabolic panel that you should ask for. But also we've got in here, when your doctor says something like, Mm -hmm. well, why would I even check a C-peptide? I don't even know what the hell that means. (laughs) Well, doctor right here on page 22 is two paragraphs that will explain to you why it's super important for you to know my fasting insulin or my C-peptide. Also, here's the list of diagnostic codes that will get my insurance to pay for it. So shut up and order the test because it's obviously a thing. There's a book written about it. So maybe you ought to do it. And if anybody wants to get a copy, we try to keep the price as low as possible. Just go to commonsenselabsbook.com. And that's where you can get a copy. There's an electronic version and also a little paperback that you can take notes in. But it's got tons of information about the labs. And we're updating this continuously. So every time you buy a copy, you're getting the latest updated version. I love that you and Kim did that. Um, everybody go get that. Alina will drop a link. Dr. Ken Berry is going to be speaking next week at KetoCon. I'll be there as well. I can't wait to see you, brother. So go you know, watch his lecture if you're going to KetoCon. Are you also doing your annual event that you tend to do in, in Nashville? What- we're, we're, we're thinking about doing it virtually this year just okay. because the, you know, the economy being what it is, the price of travel and lodging being what it is. I think it might be more thoughtful of us to just hold a, a virtual thing with inside of our private community. So uh, much like Ben's, ours, our, we have a private community. We currently have 5,600 folks in there Wow, who are, who are on a journey just to rediscover what is a proper human diet, what is optimal health, how close can I get to that? And so it's, it's, it's phdhealth.community. That's the, the website, if you don't mind sharing a link to that. Yeah, we will. Uh, because, you know, so many of you guys are out there in the wilderness alone. And you've got Ben. That's awesome. And you've got his group. Uh, but I think it's very important to find the tribe where you fit best. And, uh, you know, Ben's a great guy. But if you're like, yeah, but, you know, Dr. Barry's pretty or whatever, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> How dare you? Know, you? Come on. Come on. Come on. Don't get emotional, Ben. That, that'll reveal a lot about you, right? <laughs> you're a good looking guy. But, good. But I think I think that, that that finding your tribe where that resonates so with you. So, uh, Dr. Boz has got her tribe. Dr. Yeah. Bones got his tribe. And so find the tribe where you feel at home because mm-hmm. that's literally what that it kind of is. It's kind of your new friends and your new family because very many of us, if we start talking to our family about a proper human diet, we're going to get that look mm-hmm. and we're going to get that cold shoulder. But when you find your own tribe that, that they, they get it, that's a comfortable place to be. Yeah, I love that. PhDHealthCommunity.com. Is that right? PhD Health. Dot community. Oh, got it. PhD health dot community. Alina, let's drop that link. Um, everybody go check that out and his books and just all the things that you're doing. Dr. Barry. I'll I see love you at KetoCon. What? I'll see you at KetoCon. I'll see everybody. you in a week, my friend. Safe travels.